continuing in the book of Ephesians. Last week we were at the close of chapter 4. This week we're going to be beginning at the beginning of chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. And it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now, those of you who have been reading the Bible for many years know this, but if you see a therefore, you need to figure out what it's there for. <laughs> why is it there for? So that's why we've been doing this in order. I've been going through the end of the book of Ephesians chapter 4 with you so that you could see. And what that, that last verse, verse 32 says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. But I have a couple of questions for you. So, it says to be an imitator of God. I always asked these questions when I was little and in church. I grew up in a church like this one. And I heard a lot of wonderful messages and there's some that I remember to this day. But the thing that always gets me about the word is when somebody tells you to do something and you go, okay, be an imitator of God. Well, I, I've never, um, how? How can I imitate God, but I haven't seen him? But I want to. I want to know how, but how do I imitate God? Now, we know that Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we have an example in the life of Jesus that points us to the way that God is. And I want to, I want to just point to one scripture. We're going to talk about this one to begin with. And it's in Matthew 5. This is Jesus talking, and he says, Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wait a minute. So I'm supposed to imitate God and be perfect. Thanks. How am I supposed to do this? But... If you look at the context of what Jesus is talking about, the same way I said, look for what it's there for, what that therefore points to, Jesus was talking about loving your enemy. He's talking about loving the unlovable. He's talking about sowing into these people that may not be the people that you are, the easiest people for you to love, right? Right? And so what it says, Matthew 5, 43 through 35 says, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Uh-oh. So perfection is tied to love. It's easy, it might be easier for us if perfection was tied to a list of rules that we could check off. Wait a minute, tell me what perfect looks like by a, by a list of rules that I can check the boxes of if I'm doing them. No, I'm going to tell you that perfection looks like love and God is love. And so in this perfection he's saying, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies is what everybody else says. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, that tells us something about God when we're talking about imitating God. It just said that you, so that you could be sons of your Father in heaven. 
sons and daughters, this isn't only a male thing. This is being a child of God. This is sonship as a position in Christ. This is your position in Christ. And so for you to look like a child of God, you need to act like your Father in heaven. And Jesus is laying out how the Father acts. He lets it rain on the just and the unjust. And you should love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Some people might say at this moment, I liked it better before I understood what I should be doing. I liked it better when you were just just gloss over it and we'll go on to eat and I'll just think about it later. No, we need to think about it now. Because if we're going to be imitating God and to be perfect as he is perfect, this is the context of what that looks like. It looks like we let him live through us. And how he wants to live through you isn't based on how they're acting right now. Because if it was, and if you notice in uh, Luke, I don't think I put it in here, but yeah, I did. Okay, Luke 6, 36, it says, it's, it's the same context that Jesus is talking about. He said, be merciful just as your father is merciful. That's also in the context of judging. By the same measure that you judge, you will be judged. And so how does God act? Well, how did he act towards us? While we were in sin, enemies of God, Jesus died on the cross for us. While he was being crucified, He said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. I think that you could call someone crucifying you an enemy. But Jesus was praying for his enemies as he was being crucified. And if you've seen the Father, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And so you can come to understand that there's there's something about this that's different from how the world works. I've always said that the kingdom of God is counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what you think. We were talking about this on Wednesday night. Lower is the new higher. You die to live. It doesn't make sense in the natural. And so you're told to imitate God, and you can. Because in Christ, you've been empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the life of Jesus within you and you can reflect the glory of God to those who need to see him. And so, loving the unlovable, showing kindness and mercy to the ungrateful is being perfect like your father in love. And you may say, I can't do this. Have you met the people that I've met? Do you know, let me introduce you to some of these people who I count as enemies. It doesn't matter. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, if you look at the list of love is patient, love is kind, love never takes into account a wrong suffered, That's not talking about their list of how they have to act so that you will love them. That's talking about how love is. Totally separate from behavior. It's not what someone deserves. You didn't deserve the grace you received. Neither do they. And yet we're called to imitate God and show that grace to the world around us. And, you know, last week we were talking about this progression. I I was talking to you out of 430-31 where you can see how wickedness that's allowed, you see how bitterness that's allowed to grow in somebody's heart goes from bitterness to anger and wrath 
to clamor and slander, and then it comes into being malice. It grows from, from a small thing in somebody's heart that nobody can see to a big thing in somebody's heart that everybody can see, and the people are affected when you get around somebody who's filled with that anger and malice within them. They let something grow within them that never should have been allowed to grow. That bitterness is just a small seed when it starts. It's just a small injustice. It's a small ingratitude. It's a small irritating. Now, why'd they say that like that? And you meditate on it, and this before too long, this seed takes root and it starts growing within you, and then before too long, it's grown into a full-blown problem. And if you let it go too long, you don't even realize that you've become malicious because your heart's gotten hard and your love has gotten cold. But what I'm talking about today is the progression in the opposite direction. I'm talking about love growing within you. Because what ends up happening is when you start this relationship with Jesus, you can see how Jesus was. You can see how he lived. But in 1 John 4.19, it says, we love because he first loved us. It starts somewhere. So you may say that, I, Pastor, there, I can't love my enemies. Can you love God? Can you love God who loves you? Because we love because he first loved us. It's the beginning. It's where the seed begins. It's the life. That life is planted within you. This love is born within you when you come to that place of understanding. I love because he first loved me. I may not be able to wrap my head around who I love yet, but I know I love him because he loves me. And you remember the testimony of the beginning of your relationship with God, how you were just overwhelmed by the one that you found? I don't know about you, but I, I believe, I remember when I was little, walking an aisle because I wanted I wanted to make Jesus Lord of my life. I was probably kindergarten or first grade. And I remember hearing it and believing. And there's kids in the castle that will hear and believe today. They're even learning it in Livy's class. The three-year-olds are learning scripture and they're singing about Jesus and she brings her Bible to class. They don't always stay in there, as obvious that you saw this morning. But she can tell you the scripture verse that they learned last week. This is important because you raise them up in the way that they should go and they won't depart from it when they're old. And I, I, I sat in, a, I remember where I was. I was sitting in that kind of section, but it was in another church. And I was sitting way in the back. You know, it's the farthest walk in the world. And I remember how I was dressed that day. I remember that I had my hands in my pockets. And I was like this the whole way up there. And I walked right to the middle. And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I didn't like being in front of people. I didn't like walking and everybody seeing me. All that stuff was extra, right? But... I wanted to make him Lord of my life. But you know, their day came when I was a young man. I believe God honors that when you're a child that you want to. But the day came when I was a man that I saw Jesus in a way that I had never seen him before. And I realized that there was no way I could reach him unless he came to me. It was like a gulf between us, but he bridged it. 
And I remember the night that he did that for me. And it changed my life. And I know I, I found the love of God in a way I didn't have it before. But some of these things that we learn in the word, I know that most of you can quote the word back to me. But quoting it isn't the same as living it. And so I will keep saying the word to you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the seed lands at the appropriate time and is born within you. This life is born within you. Something takes place when you hear the word and you believe. And I live in faith that the word lands and is born within you, and the life of God is born within you, and you're renewed in your spirit, and you come to believe, and you're transformed by the power of God. And that even if you've known this your entire life, but you've never seen the power of it, you come into agreement with it today, and everything changes. And you see life born within you. And as that happens, this love He loves me first. He loved me before everything. He loved me before I had to do anything, before I became anything. He loved me with an everlasting love. And because he loves, he gives. He gave his only begotten son. He sent Jesus to die for us who were in our sin and transgressions, enemies of God. Because the day would come. He knew the day would come where we heard the word and believed. And when that day happens, the love that he's had for you becomes the love that you know now. It's not external. It's not he's loving me. He's loving me and I'm not receiving it. The day comes where I believe in Jesus and rely on him and I'm receiving the love that he's giving to me. And he loved me first and now I love him. And that love is born within me, and it grows. And as that love grows, then things happen within me that I didn't expect to happen. Because as the love grows within me, I become more like the one I love. And so what does it say in 429? It says, be kind, no, 432. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So as you're imitating God, this is what happens. There's something that takes place within you. You get a love you never expected, but not just for God. Because God loves the people around us. And something is taking place in our hearts as we love him. And as we are becoming more like him. The love is growing. And as the love grows, it's burning up the things that aren't like God within our heart. Hebrews says that God is a consuming fire. Well, God is also perfect love. Put the two together and you get a love that is consuming. It's consuming things that should not be within your heart anyway. So that when there's this unkindness within you and this desire to win or this desire to get your own way or to put yourself above everybody else, where you might have been that way your entire life and everybody that has known you before Christ would say, they're just selfish, they don't care about anybody but themselves. And then you in Christ Jesus, a new creation, see this start to come out of your mouth. You see it start to come out of your life where you start living. No, hey, you got two kids and a basket full of groceries and they're both screaming, go ahead of me. But you only have a few things. I know, but it's okay. You, you need to go before I, me. 
See, the practical application of the Word of God is life. It's for your whole life. It's not in the understanding of the concepts alone and you polish the concepts and you think about them all the time. If you never apply the word, then you're never going to see the power of the word made manifest. You're not going to go in the power of the word. See, we have to allow the word to live within us. That's Jesus, the living word of God. When his life is manifested within you, then that life becomes action. Because love isn't just a passive concept. Love is an action verb. I'm doing something. Kindness is love. Do you know the kindness of God leads men to repent? I tell you all this, and I, but I told you why I keep saying this stuff. Because today might be your day to hear it. Somebody else might have heard it 10 years ago and received it. But today might be your day where you go, <gasps> wait. You mean me hitting them over the head with the Bible for the last 10 years hasn't gotten them to change yet? Has it? No, they just run when they see me coming. Okay, well, let's break this down into really small pieces. It either works or it doesn't. If what you're doing doesn't work, you need to do something else. Some of you are believing for your spouse to come to know God. Peter said that your faithfulness will testify to them. You notice a lot of the things that we, our behavior doesn't match the word of God sometimes. Because showing kindness and forgiveness to all, he didn't say Knowing that the end is near, bludgeon people with the truth that all will die knowing. He could have. He didn't. He said, be kind, be loving, be forgiving like Christ loved you and forgave you. Why? Because God knows in God's wisdom, God knows how the people that you're ministering to are because they're just like you were. And somebody had to love you into the kingdom of God. And somebody prayed for you when you didn't want anybody to pray for you. And somebody told you the truth, but they told you the truth in love in a way that wasn't pushing you away. It just, I love you and I don't want to see you get hurt. And you see the difference? But when we start living this way, when we start living the word... Think about, you know, I could have preached this message from the way that Jesus lived his life. You know, I mean, you could see the humility of God. We talked about this on Wednesday night. You can see the humility of God. You can see the patience of God. You can see the compassion of God in the ministry of Jesus. But in reality, we should be seeing this in the ministry of our lives. Because every believer is a minister of the gospel. You have a ministry that may not be like my ministry, but you have a sphere of influence that you reach that I can't reach. And they may never come here, but they may see your kindness where you are and feel the love of God. And like, Yvette, you testified on a Wednesday night that you were showing love and you just knew that you were supposed to show love to somebody that that had adamantly said they didn't have any desire for it until that person starts pointing and saying, hey, leave her alone, she's a Christian. Wait a minute. The person who adamantly didn't want anything to do with God is now saying, I may not want it for me, but I can see something in her. And then somebody, the other part of your testimony, was somebody running up to you and throwing their arms around you and saying, pray for me. And if that's like, I love this part. I have to sell it because I'm part of the same crew. She said, I was side hug only, and this person was full hug. (laughs) Ran up, threw her arms around her. Please pray for me. Now, why would that person feel like they could ask that question? 
You don't run up to just everybody and say that. But the kindness of God is being manifested in her life. And she knows we're going to give glory to Jesus because she'll tell you that it's Christ in her. But that's what's taking place. And so how can you be perfect? How can you imitate God? You let him live his kindness and his love through you. It's just kind. That, you know, I love be kind and compassionate. It's a work in progress. I admit it. I watch Mary live her life and I think, Jesus, make my heart, my heart soft. Because she, she has a, she's seen the compassion of God in her own life and she has it. I think that's another part that we need to know is that when you've, when you've seen God be good and loving to you and when he's shown you great compassion and he's shown you great patience and he's been kind to you where you know you didn't deserve it sometimes, then you recognize the grace that you've received. And like those that have been forgiven much love much because you know how you know what you needed to come to him and he found you. So how does a well-pleasing son grow into the image of his father? We grow up in love. It's going to grow within us. That love that's within us is going to purify us. There's going to be some uncomfortable things that are revealed when the, the love is burning within your heart because you're going to realize there's places in your heart that are hard. You're not alone in this. This isn't just one person. This is that we as people, as we come into the, the saving knowledge of Jesus and we grow closer to him and we're working out our salvation, we start seeing because the Holy Spirit reveals it to us at the time when we can receive it that there's a place within us that isn't loving and kind. And we go, how long has that been there? And God says, it's just time for it to go now. It's not condemning you for the way that you were, but he is convicting you of what needs to change so that you can be like him. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 in the NIV says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. And that's what ends up happening is that love that was born within you starts growing within you. And as it grows, it starts making you more like him. And the more you get like him, the less you are like the world around you and the less of the world is manifesting through you. Your flesh isn't winning. You're allowing God to live through you and show his life through you. What happens is, instead of your love growing colder and you getting bitter, angry, or wicked, or malicious, the love starts getting hotter. And you start becoming kinder, more compassionate, more forgiving, more full of grace more patient for the people who don't know yet to the point where what it said in Ephesians 1 be imitators of God as beloved children but verse 2 says walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. When you first get started, that seems impossible, but the deeper that you get in relationship with God, the more you desire to allow God to live through you. And so the giving of yourself becomes part of the divine nature you're a partaker of. It's him. It's not you, but he's made alive in you. And so... As you grow in love, the Father's heart is revealed in you, and it burns hotter and hotter. 
and you're not holding on to things not anything of bitterness but I'm talking about you're not holding on to things that need to be sown into somebody else's life you're willing to give of yourself how did Christ act he gave of himself he gave himself up for us and now as you in the love of God that love burns hotter and hotter within you things that are worthless not necessary unimportant they start getting burned up and you start seeing the plan and purposes of God when you look at a person you don't know them by the flesh anymore you know them by the spirit and you see the potential of God within them and you see God's heart for them and you don't see somebody on the street corner you see somebody's son that shouldn't have been there that needs to know the love of God and you're not thinking from a position of judgment when you see somebody that's in suffering that's self-inflicted you're thinking I remember what it's like to live my consequences but he didn't leave me in my consequences he lifted me up he set my feet upon a rock I'm in a place where I can live in his presence now without shame because Jesus died for me. And he rose again. And that resurrection life, that resurrection to a new life is mine in Christ Jesus. All these things that hinder love start melting the hotter the flame gets, the hotter that love gets within you. The things that hinder and encumber melt. You know that the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. But it's the truth. In a heart that burns with kindness and compassion and forgiveness and love and that willingly gives itself for others is revealed because that's the Father's heart within you. That love. <sighs> Words don't really do it justice. I'm going to read a scripture to you. Today, we're not going to do it the same way we've done it. Generally, I would invite the prayer team up, but we're not going to do it that way this morning. I want you to have some time with God concerning your heart. I'm going to, not quite yet, guys. I'm going to play a video after I read this scripture. and I, We're going to turn the lights down. There's not going to be an official close. But you spend some time with God concerning your heart and allow him to minister to you. And then our team, our worship team, will play out of that song and we'll, we'll spend some time in worship. You may spend some time at the altar allowing God because if you realize that your love isn't as hot as it should be, today's the day to return. If you haven't even thought about his kindness and his love and your place in showing it, Today's the day to, to repent because he's called us to this high purpose. We represent Jesus. Song of Solomon 8.6 It says, put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is severe as Sheol. Its flames are a flames of fire, the flame of the Lord. It means death isn't stronger than love. But it is burning because it burns with the flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. 
If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. What that says is, if somebody tried to buy love from you, they said, I want what you have. I'm going to buy it from you. I'll give you everything that I have. You would despise them and say, I can't give up this for anything. Nothing on earth is worth what, what I've found. When you know love as it truly is from God, it's no longer, you can't put money on it. Money's not worth it. God, give me Jesus. Let me live in the truth. Let me glorify Jesus with my life. I know him now. I can't pretend I don't. You can't pay me to say I don't know him. Help me. I love you. There's no other way for me, Jesus. (laughs) You know, the the scripture before this says, who is this coming out of the wilderness, leaning on their beloved? How did he find us? How did he lead us out of the wilderness to salvation? How did he bring us into this life? Leaning on our beloved. There was no other way I was getting out of that wilderness in my own ability. I couldn't find salvation in my own. There's nothing I've ever done to be worthy of it. I couldn't pay the price. He paid it for me. With his body and his blood. That's why we remember him. And now I'm leaning on my beloved as I learn to love like he loves. I'm dependent on him. I can't do this in my own ability. I'm not in my own ability. I'm in him. He's with me. We're together. So we're going to dim the lights. And they're going to play a song And you know, the people that are singing the song, God bless them, but you sing the song to God. And as you just come into agreement in worship, I give you something to look at, but reality is this is between you and God, and you may need to be at the altar, you need... You may just stay at your seat. You may realize that this is the time that he has called you to this place for a reason. And if you need to make Jesus Lord of your life, just like I did when I was little and also when I came back to him when I was an adult, we'll pray right now so that you and him can talk while you're in worship. Because I want to give you a chance to know him. And so if you need to make Jesus Lord of your life or you need to return to him, pray with us right now. Jesus, I need you. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you rose again. I believe that you're praying for me right now. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and trespasses. As I forgive those who have trespassed against me. Jesus, I ask you, wash me clean. Make me new. Help me to love like you love. Because from this day forward, Jesus, You are my Lord.